I'm from South Carolina, and I know South Carolina has a ton of rural areas. I mean, my family's from Winsburg County, which is one of the most rural areas in the state, and there's need there too. The difference that I could make most, I guess, palpable is in the United States, wherever you are, you can pick up the phone and call 911, and you probably have somebody answer, you know, in the majority of the country. In the places that we travel abroad, that doesn't exist, you know, and then once you finally find a way to get to the hospital, which is usually on the back of a motorcycle or something like that, once you get there, there's usually no radiology, there's usually no labs, there's typically no doctor on duty. And so uh, just traveling abroad, I've seen countless stories of, of people losing their lives or limbs that just wouldn't happen here. Masindi is in the midwestern part of the country. It's a poor community. We have only one paved road, so the rest are muddy roads. The city of Masindi has close to 400,000 people, and most of them are mainly peasant farmers. Not so much of economic activity that happens there. Most of the patients can't afford their medical bills. What we don't want to do is do a short-term medical mission trip, show up somewhere, kind of parachute in, give a lot of medicines and treat disease, and it's great to treat disease. You know, you're, you're helping that person in that moment. But who's following up? Who's doing the long-term care? Who's making an impact in that community with those community members for years and years and years to come? So the reason we created One World Health was to create a sustainable impact in each of the communities that we serve with our short-term teams with a long-term solution as well. And so what we do is we build hospitals and infrastructure systems in the countries that we're invested in. And those are run full time while we're not there, all the time, 365 days a year, 24 seven, by locals. If it wasn't for Masindic Tara Medical Center, many of the patients would have to trek for a long distance to go to other hospitals. The nearest I think is around 200 kilometers. And those who couldn't afford I don't know what would happen, maybe we would have to lose life. Many times you realize that some of these patients can't afford, you know, specialized services. Telemedicine helps us to make sure that they access these services at a free cost because we don't charge them for any telemedicine consults. It has improved the quality of care in so many ways. We have the ability to get in touch with a very senior physician from MUC or any part of the US who can actually give an expert opinion and uh, we are able to get the right diagnosis. I've had consults with dermatologists, internists, cardiologists, uh, gynecologists, radiologists. As radiologists, that's what we do every day. We look at images and we make diagnoses. And so it was just a natural fit for us to create an elective for our radiology residents that in their senior year of training, so their final year before they finish, if they want to, they can get involved with this telemedicine concept while they're here in the United States and also do a month-long elective in Uganda, working with the imagers there and the physicians there. So when I went there, basically what they told us is that they had just gotten some radiology equipment, ultrasound and x-ray, and they had some experience with it. They had a radiology technologist, so I was able to go out there and work with them and I basically just show them how to use imaging to problem solve, um, answer clinical questions, decide what to do with patients because for the longest time they just didn't have that. And so they were trying to treat patients without imaging, which here just sounds completely foreign. Almost everybody who comes here gets like an x-ray or an ultrasound or a CT something. With the infectious diseases, being able to take a chest x-ray, being able to take an abdominal x-ray, is, is amazing because you know the symptoms can overlap for a lot of different things but their imaging appearance their stereotypic appearance on imaging can be very clear-cut and we can differentiate one from another and again to not having that to all of a sudden having that is great but it's challenging and so for someone like the local practitioners who don't haven't had the formal training haven't had the the, the time that we've had to develop those skills it can be daunting and so now we're available all the time through that WhatsApp platform, which is, it, it is encrypted, but we still de-identify everything just for patient privacy. But they can just, they can send it to us. And oftentimes I don't know right off the bat, so I'll show it to a few of my colleagues and they can just get a wealth of, of people's eyes on that and, and get an answer in real time. The crack, the puzzles for me, especially when it comes to imaging, radiology, chests, imaging, abdominal imaging, and muscle imaging and everything. They are just great people. 
it's mutually beneficial. They're able to ask questions and able to receive responses from specialists that we have here in that exact field that they're, they have a question about. And for us, it's really interesting because we get to see cases that we don't normally see here. So the students, they come back more encouraged to deliver care here in the United States to people who need it, as well as abroad. I think it changes people's hearts, you know, not only their minds, you see the difference, right? But then your heart has changed too and, you're not, and, and you start to think. Those students and residents are more likely to deliver care to impoverished areas within our own state. Being there and seeing the conditions that the people living there were in and, you know, what they had to endure to receive care and really just kind of living in that environment with them. It's one thing to learn about it and read about it and try and practice it, but to really experience it in that setting really helped me kind of solidify that empathy that you want to show your patients and the care you want to provide for them. Am I doing the best I can with what I have here? Because those guys are doing the best they can over there with what they have. And so I try and hold myself up to their standard, honestly, now when I practice here. We operate way above our capacity simply because of telemedicine. And patients over time have learned that because Many times we are faced with patients who are above, you know, the capacity of the hospital. You get a patient who has had a lesion for a way long time, and then they have tried all the facilities around, they can't get the answer. They tell them that you go to Masindic Tara Medical Center, not that we have a specialist in that particular area, but because patients know that we have the capacity to diagnose them and treat them. We've had patients who would actually have died if it wasn't because of telemedicine. So at this point, with telehealth, if a small community in Africa, in Miss Indy, just hours away from the city, intermittent blackouts, is able to send us images on demand to a specialist and get a specialist answer to a complicated question, that should be the same way it is for anybody. That, you know, there's no reason that if you have a question that can't be answered by somebody who is the expert in that field, I think telemedicine is pretty radically transforming what we're able to do and I think it's going to continue to. I mean, the one piece of infrastructure that does seem to be developing in underdeveloped nations is cellular service, so cellular data. So the fact that we're able to use that data transmission to affect clinical decisions kind of almost in real time without flying over to Uganda is a big, big win for us. And you know, to get a group of specialists, to get radiologists, cardiologists and all to, to travel abroad like that where they might not be able to they might not have a CT machine or an MRI machine over there and they might not have a cardiac cath lab but they do have needs you know for these specialists but not maybe not enough to fly over every quarter but they do have enough to like to be able to access on a day-to-day -day basis and just having that is is amazing and also may I say no one's charging anybody for this so everybody who's involved in this is doing this for free so everybody's doing this just out of the goodness of their heart. And I mean, that's rewarding. And you, it takes a special kind of person to sign up for basically a lot more work <laughs> for nothing. And you know, I think that speaks very highly to people who are involved in global health and telehealth at this university. You were given a chance with this to make a difference in people's lives in a really meaningful, impactful way, in a really tangible way. These are, these are my friends you know, while I was working there. These are, you know, the people that I met were so appreciative and so thankful. I mean, not only, you know, for your own personal award, but for the patients that you care for and the people that you're, you know, that you meet there. I mean, how can you not really feel that benefit from going on this, something like this, it's being a part of the trip to Uganda or anywhere in the world where you can do, make a difference. I want global health to be a part of my career for the rest of my life. It's something I want to do. Now knowing that it's possible, I can't see myself not doing it.